Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you all for tuning in to today's webinar. My name is Stephanie Demiglio. I am the Business Development Coordinator here at Bancroft Neuro Rehab. In recognition of Brain Injury Awareness Month, Bancroft Neuro Rehab is proud to be a premier provider of post-acute neurologic rehabilitation, offering residential and day services, as well as outpatient rehabilitation, available both in person and via telehealth at our three locations in Southern and Central New Jersey. Mount Laurel, Plainsboro, and Toms River. Bancroft Neuro Rehab is a division of Bancroft, a provider of programs and services for people with autism, intellectual disability, and other neurological conditions. Next, I would like to introduce today's presenters. From our Plainsboro location, we have Dr. Ivan Van Bakova, Rehabilitation Supervisor, Cerise Carmen D. Sapp, Speech Language Pathologist, Dr. Satara Shanmugam, Neuropsychology Postdoctoral Fellow, and we also have a very special guest joining us today. We have Matt Kalora, a brain injury survivor and a published author who was a client at Bancroft Neural Rehab. Now I will turn the presentation over to Cerise who is going to get us started. Thank you all for joining us today. The clinicians involved in this presentation do not have any disclosures to announce. Book sales are proprietary to Matt Kalora. I am Cerise, one of the speech pathologists here at Bancroft Neural Rehab. This presentation was truly created using a transdisciplinary approach. The content um, includes contributions from many members of our team. I would like to thank Nicole, one of our occupational therapy students, for all of the work that she put into this project. Our intention is to share with you the elements of an effective transdisciplinary team and to leave you with a deeper understanding of brain injury recovery. We will be outlining the components and the professionals involved in the transdisciplinary approach with an emphasis on team collaboration, always with a person-centered focus. And we will be illustrating the real and meaningful progress that someone can make in the years after a brain injury through sharing with you a case study. You will then have the opportunity to hear Matt's story and his personal perspective of the impact the transdisciplinary approach has had on his rehabilitation journey. So let's begin by looking at some statistics. Traumatic brain injury, or TBI, is a leading cause of death and disability among children and young adults in the United States. Each year, an estimated 1.5 million Americans sustain a TBI. As a consequence of these injuries, 230,000 people are hospitalized and survive. 50,000 people die. 80 to 90,000 people experience the onset of long-term disability. And as defined by the CDC, disability is any condition of the body or mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities and to interact with the world around them. Our program is located in New Jersey, so here is some data at a more local level. In New Jersey each year, between 12 and 15,000 New Jerseyans sustain a TBI. 1,000 of these New Jersey residents will die. 175,000 New Jersey residents are currently living with the disabilities from a TBI. There are um, almost 6,000 fall hospitalizations, 1,700 motor vehicle crash hospitalizations, and 600 assault hospitalizations. In recent years, there's been increased public awareness about concussions, especially those related to sports injuries. But it may not yet be common knowledge that a concussion is, in fact, a mild traumatic brain injury that could potentially have long-term effects on all aspects of a person's life. Most individuals who suffer a concussion should recover within two to four weeks. However, 10 to 15% will experience symptoms beyond that time. These symptoms may appear immediately after the concussion or in the days and weeks following. After one mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, the brain injury is significantly more affected by the neurological cascade of each successive injury. These are the functional domains that can be impaired following a traumatic brain injury. They include motor deficits such as hemiplegia, spasticity and contractures, um, dysfunctions of swallowing and speech. They include changes in language, such as uh, the impaired ability to find words, form grammatical sentences, comprehend language, read and write. 
They can cause somatosensory issues, such as dysfunction with proprioception, tactile sensation, thermal sensation, pressures, pressure sensation, and pain. There may be visual deficits, such as poor visual acuity, impaired visual movements, including tracking, saccades, and fixation, impaired emergence, and impaired binocular vision. And lastly, brain injuries may cause cognitive deficits, including impaired attention, impaired memory, slowed processing speed, changes in executive functioning, categorization, decreased insight to deficits, and decrease or a lack of motivation and initiation. As described by a report by the CDC, the long-term impairments and disabilities associated with TBI are grave, and the full human cost is incalculable. Yet because these disabilities are not readily apparent to the public, unlike a broken leg, for example, TBI is referred to as the invisible epidemic. These disabilities arising from cognitive, emotional, sensory, and motor impairments often permanently alter a person's vocational aspirations and have profound effects on social and family relationships. As a person with a brain injury recovers and begins to re-enter the community, they may face many barriers to successfully returning to activities they previously participated in. These community barriers could include difficulty accessing transportation, such as the inability to drive or the inability to access public transportation. Challenges with accessibility, being able to enter buildings and facilities easily. Reduced community awareness. Many individuals in the community are not aware of brain injuries. Um, there may be changes in their support system. There are often financial challenges. The individual may not be able to work. There may be limitations on insurance coverage and they may have high medical costs. There may be challenges with maintaining relationship with their family and friends. Um, difficulties interacting safely and appropriately in the community. Um, difficulty gaining and maintaining employment. And difficulty accessing services and resources that do already exist for those with brain injuries. Part of what we hope you all take away from this presentation today is the understanding that a brain injury is not a single event, but rather a chronic condition. There's been the misconception that a brain injury is similar to an injury to any other part of the body. If you break a bone, maybe you're given a cast and have some therapy and eventually the bone heals. No other part of your body should be affected. A brain injury is not like this. The scientific data shows that a brain injury, in fact, affects multiple organs and can accelerate disease. Statistically, individuals who have sustained a TBI experience higher rates of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's-like symptoms, neuroendocrine disorders, epilepsy, psychiatric disease, musculoskeletal dysfunction, incontinence, and more. In addition, survivors of brain injuries are two times more likely to die as compared to non-brain injured persons and have approximately a life expectancy reduction of seven years. What this means is that skilled services may be required beyond the few months and years following an injury. A transdisciplinary team may be needed throughout an individual's life to ensure that that person is able to continue to function at their greatest potential. A skilled therapy and medical team can help to slow the progression of disease, minimize the impact on one's quality of life, and keep them engaged in activities that are most important and meaningful to them. Thank you, Cerise. Good afternoon, I'm Yvonne, I'm a physical therapist, and I just wanna echo what you said, Cerise. A transdisciplinary team is needed throughout an individual's life who sustain a brain injury to ensure that this person is able to continue to function at their highest and greatest potential. A transdisciplinary team is a group of specialists working towards a common goal or goals of their clients or patients. So who are the members of a transdisciplinary team? As you can see from this list, there are many, and depending on the facility where you work, it's not all inclusive. Occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language pathology, neuropsychology, cognitive and vocational services are what we, on, what we focus on today, 
but a transdisciplinary team also includes nursing, dietitians, music therapy, social workers, clinical case managers, and physicians. Decisions regarding assessment, goal planning, and discharge should be done by relevant members of a transdisciplinary team and collaborated with the patient and or family. In the literature, the terms interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary are frequently used interchangeably, but there are some major differences. Transdisciplinary teams consist of a group of professionals from various backgrounds who work together to enhance patient care. They integrate the natural, social, and health sciences in a humanities context and transcend their traditional boundaries. Transdisciplinary teams coordinate and collaborate for assessment and intervention frequently and consistently. They offer flexible professional roles where some of the responsibilities are shared across disciplines. They share information for planning and determine intervention goals jointly. Somewhere in between transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary are the interdisciplinary teams. They discuss and share perspectives to set goals and identify intervention priorities. They collaborate and communicate for assessment and intervention and aim to provide less fragmentation of services. Multidisciplinary teams are somewhat the opposite of transdisciplinary teams. Multidisciplinary team members are a group of professionals from various backgrounds who work separately and independently they come together to report assessment results and intervention outcomes from the perspective of their own discipline. And they generally do not engage in joint planning or intervention. A successful transdisciplinary team requires leadership, person-centered care, communication, and teamwork. Working towards the primary goal, as it is stated in the Essential Brain Injury Guide, to maximize each individual's cognitive, physical, and psychosocial ability while helping the individual to successfully respond emotionally to their specific life challenges. Brain injuries are complex and the effects of brain injury can vary due to the location of the brain injury, the severity and cause. No two brain injuries are the same, which means that no one professional can address all the issues related to the brain injury. As Zasler et al. stated, traumatic brain injury is associated with long-term, frequently debilitating symptoms that go well beyond physical complications. Symptoms in the social, cognitive, and behavioral domains are often cited as the greatest long-term hurdles to overcome. As specialists in brain injury rehab, we understand common patterns of recovery, how certain types of injuries will likely manifest into functional challenges, but every person and every injury is different. Every patient comes to us with a unique story and set of challenges, and it's our responsibility as a team to get to know and understand that patient as an individual. Together, we learn what that person's priority are and what motivates them. We work to address the needs of the whole person and not just look at the injury. The long-term effects of a brain injury also keeps changing as survivors grow older and the team needs to address and adapt the treatment goals centered around the individual. Next, we're going to switch, some, switch gears and look at some uh, brain injury outcomes and research. We use outcome measures to determine therapeutic effectiveness and provide evidence-based treatments. Given the nature of the transdisciplinary team used at Bancroft Neuro Rehab, the clinicians are able to collaborate to determine the most effective approach to treatment. Treatment goals are based off the client's goal, and clinicians can use a variety of outcome measures to determine what skills need to be enhanced in order for clients to achieve their goals. Some outcome measures, such as the Functional Independence Measure, or the FIM, and the Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory, MPAI, from now on I'm gonna use the MPAI uh, and not the whole Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory, 
Uh, it includes many domains of brain injury rehab, such as mobility, ADLs, activities of daily living, vision, social skills, leisure skills, vocational, money management, etc. Other outcome measures are more specific to one discipline, for instance, the Berg balance scale and the six minute walk test that you see on this list. They're used by physical therapy, while the Barthel and the Lawton index are used by occupational therapy. The MPAI provides a standardized measure of abilities, adjustment and social and community participation and is one of the primary outcome measures used at Bancroft Neuro Rehab. A score of zero on any item indicates the individual is experiencing no functional impairment. Higher scores are associated with higher levels of impairment. Each year, Bancroft tracks the MPAI scores of our clients to ensure the quality of care being provided. The scores in these graphs indicate that our clients at Bancroft had a lower overall level of impairment in 2018 as compared to the previous two years. The goal, of course, is to have lower scores each year for every individual, and we adjust our rehab goals according to the improvements made or new areas that need to be addressed. One of the few studies published about the effectiveness of trans transdisciplinary team approach in brain in injury rehab is this study by Powell et al. It shows the positive effects of a team approach to brain injury rehabilitation. The study was conducted in London, England, and it was a randomized treatment trial of 110 participants. One group, half of the participants, received two to six hours of therapy consisting of occupational therapy, speech language pathology, psychology and social work, and the other group received one information session where the participants received an information booklet about brain injury. The participants were diverse, similar to our patients at Bancroft. The participants were between 16 and 65 years of age, and were three months to 20 years post-traumatic brain injury. According to this study, the group receiving the team approach made significant gains in self-organization, psychological well-being, personal care, and mobility as opposed to the control group. The study validated that a team approach to brain injury rehabilitation benefits also patients who are many years post-injury. As we mentioned before, there are many members of the transdisciplinary team. However, since we have our guest Matt joining us today, we concentrated on the disciplines that are mainly involved in his rehab. Occupational therapy, vocational therapy, physical therapy, speech language pathology, cognitive therapy, and psychology. Occupational therapists or OTs are licensed clinicians with a master's or doctorate degree. Occupational therapists are trained to develop or recover meaningful activities or also called occupations, such as ADLs, activities of daily living, return to work or school, home and life management tasks, such as laundry, cooking, medication management, and financial management. The OTs can have a variety of additional specializations or expertise, such as certified brain injury specialist, vision therapy, they can conduct driver pre-assessments or driver's rehab, pre-vocational assessments, and perform cognitive therapy. Next, we have vocational rehab. And vocational services in the setting of neurorehabilitation is the process of enabling persons with functional and cognitive disabilities to overcome barriers that allow access to maintain or return to paid employment or volunteering. An employment specialist will take a person-centered approach in identifying skills, areas of interest, and personalized goals for the clients to ensure the best outcomes. Some of the focus of vocational sessions include work hardening or conditioning, for example, to increase muscle strength, endurance, and joint mobility, and soft skill development, for instance, communication, time management, hygiene, grooming, resume writing, and developing interviewing skills by role-playing. Next is physical therapy. 
And physical therapists are movement experts who improve quality of life through prescribed exercise, hands-on care, and patient education. The degree required to become a physical therapist is the Doctor of Physical Therapy, or a DPT, and a license is required and is obtained after passing a national board's examination. There are many PTs that have a bachelor's or master's degree and have many years of experience in neurorehabilitation. Physical therapists can have additional clinical certification, such as the Certified Brain Injury Specialty Certification that I mentioned with OT, and expertise in vision therapy, vestibular therapy, and other specific modalities to the population that we treat. Physical therapy and brain injury rehab focuses on pain management to reduce the need for opioids and improve mobility without pain. Avoiding surgery, for instance, due to contracture development, which we would try to prevent, improved mobility and movement, fall prevention, and with that comes improving balance to decrease falls. Physical therapists frequently collaborate with orthotists for in interventions to improve mobility by providing, for instance, a modified ankle foot orthosis or a MAFO, and we frequently collaborate with physiatrists to consult about spasticity management or pain management. Physiatrists have consulted with us to determine which muscle groups to target, for instance, for Botox injections. As mentioned, speech therapy is a big part of our transdisciplinary team, and Cerise will follow up with that. So what is a speech language pathologist? Well, a speech language pathologist is a licensed clinician with a master's degree and is certified by the American Speech and Hearing Association. SLPs evaluate and provide skilled intervention in the following areas. Speech for disorders such as dysarthria and apraxia. Um, language to address issues such as aphasia. Social skills, cognition, and swallowing. Many of the SLPs here at Bancroft Neuro Rehab are also certified brain injury specialists and have additional certifications in specific therapeutic techniques to meet the needs of individuals with neurological conditions. Cognitive therapists play an integral role in the transdisciplinary team. A cognitive therapist may have different educational and professional backgrounds, such as psychology, education, or neuroscience. These clinicians are responsible for addressing cognitive challenges that impact functional independence. This may range from being able to recall recent events to performing complex tasks in preparation to return to work. Cognitive therapy includes both cognitive remediation programs for improving underlying skills, such as memory and attention, and the use of individualized compensatory strategies to support functional independence. As an example, therapists often teach their patients to use aids, such as a planner or phone apps, to help with memory and scheduling. Functional goals might include accessing transportation, shopping on a budget, and learning to use technology to stay connected with friends and family. Cognitive therapists work closely with family, group home staff, and day program staff to ensure that effective strategies are carried over to all areas of the person's life and the role of neuropsychology in brain injury rehab. So a neuropsychologist is a licensed practitioner with a doctoral degree in either PhD or SIB, and generally within the fields of clinical psychology, and they've also completed a two-year fellowship in neuropsychology. So within uh, rehabilitation, the goal of neuropsychology is to optimize the health, independence, and quality of life of the person served, this is facilitated by understanding the brain injury and its impact on the person's functioning throughout their process, throughout the process of rehabilitation. This is done through different ways, such as conducting baseline neuropsychological assessments to obtain their level of cognitive functioning and to gauge how they're doing in different cognitive domains, such as orientation, attention, memory, executive functioning, and language. This provides an assessment of the person's cognitive strengths and areas of improvement. And this information can be important in terms of understanding barriers to participation in rehabilitation, educating the patient and his or her family, and in assisting with treatment planning and discharge considerations. At Bancroft, we also do annual neuropsychological assessments to develop the patient and their family's understanding of how injury, illness, and aging 
can cause changes in an individual's thinking, memory, judgment, emotional functioning, and behavior. For example, the capacity of a person's ability to manage their finances independently may decline over time. And so these evaluations can provide us with valuable information regarding where the person is currently. Also, part of neuropsychology is engaging in psychotherapy to process the loss of the person serves old life and transition into their new life. And depending on the person serves injury, and behavioral issues at times, there are different behavioral plans that are also created with the input of the treatment team to modify any maladaptive behaviors and to increase engagement across settings. So now we'll transition to the next segment of our presentation by sharing Matt's story. Matt sustained a traumatic brain injury in 2011, secondary to a snowboarding accident. He was found two to three hours after the accident and intubated. He sustained a subarachnoid hemorrhage, multiple contusions, axonal shearing and a focal hematoma of the right midbrain. He was in a coma for approximately two and a half weeks and after four months he was discharged home and subsequently became a resident of a Bancroft group home in 2013. He has a strong family and support and family and friend supportive background which has been an integral part in him uh, going through this rehab process. And currently Matt receives different services. So in terms of residential services, he currently lives in a group home with four other individuals. Staff is present 24 hours a day and provides support to the person served based on their level of supervision and assistance. Matt is involved in home management activities such as cleaning, laundry, meal planning and preparation, house meetings and recreational group activities. Prior to the pandemic, the residents of the group home would often go on outings in the community and Matt was involved in planning these. Some of his therapies take place in the home. His therapists collaborate with the staff in the group home and maintain an open line of communication. The team works to adapt the environment to Matt's needs and to support increasing independence. At day program, pre-COVID, Matt attended the day program five days a week. He attended many of his therapies while at the day program. In addition to individual therapy, the person served also participate in a variety of group activities focused on improving functional skills for community reentry. In fact, Matt leads his peers in a weekly group discussion. Matt also receives physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, cognitive therapy, neuropsychology, music therapy, vocational therapy, as well as group therapies. In terms of neuropsychology, Matt's current goal is to manage emotional lability, and this is done using different strategies to cope with mood, such as mindfulness, exploring episodes of distress and identifying antecedents and consequences. Evidence-based approaches such as cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy are utilized, and these sessions have focused on exploring his thoughts, emotions, and behaviors as they relate to his rehabilitation journey. In sessions, Matt has been working on the acceptance of his TBI and identifying his values and goals for the future. For example, Matt has always enjoyed writing and strongly values independence, which has been, which has been able to he has been able to gain through the recent publication of his first book. Matt also receives uh, individual cognitive therapy services that have allowed him to achieve goals to balance things such as mindfulness, compensatory strategies for memory, time management, problem solving, decision making, and various executive functioning skills needed to advance his independence with instrumental activities of daily living. Matt has been able to learn discipline in following a rigorous schedule and carrying over skills and recommendations of his clinicians across all disciplines. Application of Matt's ability to carry over these skills has allowed Matt to have pride and continued motivation to taking the next steps in his rehabilitation goals, where he hopes to transition into a residential apartment setting. Examples of the compensatory strategies he uses include phone apps for taking notes, a binder with information about therapies, phone alarms, and a structured color-coded monthly schedule that is broken down by hour. This includes his therapies, home exercises, home management tasks, meal prep and planning, and group prep times. He has this posted in his bedroom and he checks things off daily. Uh, Matt has made tremendous progress in speech therapy during his time here at Bancroft. With the support of his speech therapists, Matt has worked diligently to overcome challenges with speaking clearly and eating safely to work towards his ultimate goal of working and living independently. He receives individual speech therapy once a week and participates in group speech therapy sessions twice weekly. 
Matt often seeks out opportunities to challenge himself and to practice what he learns in therapy, both in our program and in the community. He enjoys sharing his poetry and thoughts with his peers and today with all of you. He challenges himself each year to deliver a speech to all of his supporters at his annual 5K race, which he organizes. In regards to speech, we've worked to make speech more intelligible through practicing compensatory strategies such as exaggerated and slower speech. Matt practices these techniques in drill-like exercises and in more spontaneous and natural conversation. We use audio and video recording to help Matt assess his own performance and to be more aware of how understandable his speech is to others. We've also consulted with a prosthodontist who custom made Matt an oral appliance called a palatal lift to physically elevate the soft palate to help reduce the nasal voice quality. Matt's injury also caused changes in swallowing function. In speech therapy, we targeted strengthening the muscles and improving the timing and coordination of the movements involved in swallowing. Matt has learned to follow a protocol of swallowing strategies to eat and drink safely, to reduce the risk of choking or having any food or liquid enter his lungs. He's now able to eat and drink anything he likes with some precautions to stay safe. He has a program of exercises to perform, which helps to maintain the progress he's made. His speech therapists have worked in collaboration with day program and group home staff to support Matt with reminders to follow this protocol during meals if he needs it. Another example of how our team approach has supported continued progress. We will now discuss Matt's um, experience in physical therapy. Thanks, Reese. In physical therapy, Matt has made significant progress since he started therapy with us. He started with a wheeled walker and an ankle foot orthosis, but had a hard time keeping his left hand on the walker due to spasticity in the left arm. We adapted the walker with a platform on the left to improve functional independence. And initially, Matt was really focused on ambulating with a, a white based quad cane or a single point cane. But since he realized that functional independence was greater with the platform walker, uh, he agreed to start doing that. He now emulates independently everywhere with the platform walker, indoor, outdoor, and he improved his balance and decreased his risk for falls. We continue to work on emulation with a white base quad cane or a single point cane in physical therapy, since this is still one of the long-term goals of Matt. A major focus of brain injury rehab is generalization. This means that the acquired skills transfer from the therapy environment to the home environment. Initially, Matt could only emulate with his father or with a physical therapist. Through extensive training of other clinicians and staff and Matt's increasing confidence, we slowly progressed to Matt emulating with assistance with other cl clinicians and staff. Eventually, he progressed to emulating independently. Problem solving and transferring gained knowledge into novel situations is key to progress. An example of how Matt demonstrated transference of the skills that he gained in therapies was that in the past year during the pandemic, Matt had to be in various environments due to quarantine precautions, as well as being at his parents' house. Matt was probably in three to four different environments with different bathrooms, different flooring, different setup and transitioned easily without any incident. In occupational therapy, Matt works on strengthening of the right upper extremity, which is his dominant side, spasticity management of the left upper extremity, and for instance, learning how to lock reverse wheelchair brakes with the left hand. Activities of daily living, such as dressing and showering, and functional mobility, such as transfers. The progress that Matt has made is, is significant. He can now independently transfer between his wheelchair and the toilet, the bed, and various chairs. As shown in these pictures, Matt is now able to cook using the stove and oven at the wheelchair level. He has learned to use adaptive equipment, such as a rocker knife, to prepare food. And he has also explored adaptive approaches to leisure activities that he enjoys 
such as riding his recumbent bicycle on the street. Occupational therapy has worked closely with physical therapy to complete home assessments at the apartment setting in preparation for Matt to move to a lower level of supervision and assistance. Matt uses both a wheelchair and a walker for functional mobility, and with PT and OT, Matt's standing tolerance and, and balance has improved greatly, and he's now able to stand independently using a walker and can perform self-care tasks at the sink or doing laundry, as seen in this video. In this video, he's in a uh, harness called a solo step, and we work uh, in preparation for transitioning to an apartment with the white base quad cane uh, to work on the laundry and uh, kitchen skills. PT and OT work together to modify the environment to improve independence and safety. Here's Lisa and I working together. Lisa is the occupational therapist. We're going to move on to vocational rehab, which is uh, currently done by our certified occupational therapy assistant, Carrie. And after completion and publication of Matt's book, Matt shared his long-term goals of being able to gain employment as a freelance writer. Matt wants to be able to write specifically as a columnist and continue to share his experience as a traumatic brain injury survivor. With further discussion and completion of assessments, it was determined that Matt wanted to work on creating a resume, developing profiles to inline online employment sites such as Indeed and LinkedIn, to search for job opportunities, post resumes and research companies. Internally within Bancroft, Matt partnered with the Central Jersey Connection Newsletter Committee to submit bi-monthly articles. These articles provide a way to work on skills to be able to meet deadlines and demonstrate flexibility in content expectation and overall writing skills. We asked Matt what his thoughts were on the rehab approach that we have at Bancroft. And this is what he told us and wrote for us. One consistent idea all of my Bancroft therapists try to stress is acceptance. Maybe when we think of therapy, we think of an injured individual rehabilitating to become the person he or she once was. Therapy, at least at Bancroft, is not like that. My brain injury gave me a new life, and each one of my therapies, physical, speech, occupational, cognitive, neuropsychology, and vocational, helps me to accept that and helps me to make my best life. Physical therapy gives me exercises to do daily to rehabilitate key muscle groups, helping build confidence. Speech therapy improves the intelligibility of my speech so I can communicate with others more fluidly. It also improves the quality of my voice and thus improves my confidence. Occupational therapy helps me not only to work on my impaired hands and arms, but it helps me to find novel ways to live my current life. Cognitive therapy helps me address my current cognitive challenges, such as making and maintaining a schedule. Following a schedule can be very challenging for me, and cognitive therapy helps me to tackle that challenge. Neuropsychology helps me to work through my problems, something essential, essential to a brain injury survivor. Vocational therapy helps me to identify my strengths and how I can best bring value to the workforce and help me contribute to society. So what is next for Matt? Matt's goals are to move into an apartment. So what does that entail? Safe swallowing, maneuvering in a galley kitchen, which does not fit a platform walker or a wheelchair, one roommate, which is different from the group home situation he's in now where he shares uh, a house with four other roommates, entering and exiting an apartment, locking and un un unlocking doors, in an apartment complex with community interaction and maintaining safety in the end interactions, paid employment, which involves time management, and community transportation. Next, Matt will read for you an excerpt from his book and I would uh, warn you to grab your tissues 
and uh, Matt will provide a brief introduction and then read his uh, excerpt. I am now going to read an entry from my book, Profoundly Relevant Meditations. If you have the book, feel free to turn to page four to follow along. Those worlds. I still have times when sadness compounds. I still think, why must I live like this? And where can I find joy? Yet, I am generally, generally happy. My happiness does, does not come from making an excellent and physical recovery. I do not look to running to find joy. Running is years, if not lifetimes, away. Rather, happiness comes from a positive mindset. Gone are the days when I desperately chase a dream dependent on my brain's tenuous connection to my body. I now have a stronger dependence on my brain's accessible connection to my soul. Where my brain body connection finds little joy, the available Brain soul connection compensates. My body lives in a world limited by disability. However, my soul lives in the world without limits. Thanks, Matt. That was awesome. Um, so to the audience, if you would like to cry a little bit more and laugh uh, a, a lot more, then go ahead and scan this QR code and uh, purchase Matt's book. Yvonne, may I say one thing? To anybody listening, I don't ask that you buy my book, but I do ask that you did spread the word because marketing costs money. Money I don't want to spend. And if you can do me a favor and help me out with that, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. This concludes our presentation. On behalf of Bancroft Nora Rehab, I would like to thank you for joining today's presentation.